Thank you. Okay, good evening everybody and welcome. It's so lovely to see a goodly crowd of folk that I know, some of which, some I don't, and how lovely. It's always a great privilege to speak here. I was talking to Anthony Thorley this morning and uh, he said, you know, it's lovely, work. it's lovely speaking at Steiner House. And I didn't like to say, I know, I've done it before. But <laughs> I let him think it was, you know, he was telling me something new. And it is true that it's a lovely atmosphere speaking here. So I want to thank Marion for, and also for continuing this wonderful uh, circle of, uh, of speakers that come here. It's a really marvelous thing you do, Marion. You should be well proud. <laughs> so, shaking the spear. How a group of philanthropic writers and philosophers united to create a new language and make England the intellectual center of Europe. William Shakespeare was the name, or the moniker, you might say, given to this manifestation of social and spiritual intervention. Now, I'm linking, I sort of join the dots in my research, um, and then some of them don't join, so we have to just go a little further on another <coughs> <coughs> research area. But I try and link the people, the places, and the ideology of the early modern period. Um, I'm looking at the Druidic principles, the Rosicrucian and Masonic undercurrent in the works of Shakespeare. Um, at the time we're talking about, there was a great deal of esoteric, es esoteric knowledge uh, being exchanged between England and Europe uh, by people like uh, John Dee and um, uh, Giordano Bruno, who we'll come on to later. And then a hundred years later, the Huguenots who, who uh, <coughs> came to England in the 16th and 17th centuries, by the 18th century were having a profound effect on the name and the fame of Shakespeare. So why would the author write plays and poems that are saturated with, am I standing in the way of this? No, good. Uh, why would he write the plays and poems saturated with hermetic and Rosicrucian symbolism, uh, intended to raise the level of consciousness, which is what the works do, and it's what symbolism, uh, uh, hermetic symbolism does. How would he have had the knowledge of the movement of the tides, uh, of, the, of the law, of the inner workings of court life? How would he have had an intimate understanding of kingship with its sacred themes of order and of love? Now, the Shakespeare plays are about all these things, but most importantly, they are about an engagement with language <coughs> and with the logos. And there we have it. That is all we have of the writings of the man William Shakespeare of Stratford, a man who couldn't even write his own name the same way twice. And in fact, uh, it's known that these may not even be his signatures, they may be Clark's signatures. So it's quite possible we have absolutely nothing of his writing, uh, no um, paperwork, no nothing that would show us he could even write. Um, but I don't believe in the sort of denigration of uh, the man Shakespeare. I think he was a very important part of the story, but he wasn't the writer. So <clears throat> here we have the image we were given, the Druchart portrait in the folio, and here is what seems to be a mask with an enormous head implying a brain, uh, a face like a mask. You can see there are two or three lines there. It seems to be floating over his shoulders. And then you have this strange anomaly of the two left shoulders. They're both, that's a left shoulder, and so is that a left shoulder. Uh, now, that is all quite odd and meaningless in a sense, but of course it has meaning in uh, kind of esoteric terms. So the Wilton Circle is what I believe was the circle of writers that did create the works of Shakespeare. Now they were a movement intending to bring grace and dignity to the English language, a highly sophisticated combination of iambic pentameter, 
blank verse and prose. This was what they were teaching, learning, and writing. The group of talented writers were doing just that, inspired by Ovid, Plato, Virgil, Plutarch, Petrarch, uh, and Ficino, all read predominantly in their original languages. Uh, most of these pieces of work, most of these writings hadn't yet been translated into English. Uh, begun at Wilton House, the home of the Earls of Pembroke, by Sir Philip Sidney. And here is Wilton House. And this part is the original part. This is what Mary Sidney and the Earls of Pembroke lived in. The rest is slightly later, well, it's uh, a good 50 years later by the later Earls and Inigo Jones. But this part is the original, and it was full of light, wonderful windows, and it had a, um, a, a kind of observatory uh, at the top. So a unique building uh, in any case. Now, why Wilton House? Mary Sidney married the Earl of Pembroke, the second Earl of Pembroke. And this is, well, this is key to the whole story of Shakespeare, because this is where the money came in. Um, he was incredibly wealthy. The whole family were, were wealthy. The Pembrokes were a wealthy, um, titled family. The, the father, in fact, her father-in-law, um, had been a great colleague of Henry VIII and had been given the land to build his house on, which had been a nunnery. Um, and um, here became what Gary Waller, one of the scholars of Mary Sidney, calls a seed bed of literary revolution. I like that. A seed bed of literary revolution happened here at Wilton House. So the Mary's marriage is key to the whole story. And this is Mary Sidney uh, in one of her glorious collars. She was born in 1561. Uh, John Donne said of her and her brother, they teach us why, they tell us why, and teach us how to sing. The implication from John Donne is that they were instructors. They were teaching. They were giving out knowledge about the art of writing, the iambic pentameter, the prose. They founded the Areopagus, or the Wilton Circle, which Mary then continued after Philip's death. Um, here is Philip Sidney and Robert Sidney, the Divine Brothers, um, the Poet Brothers. This is a really dis wonderful discovery, this picture, because I think it's so charming to see the two of them together. You never normally see this uh, picture. Now, Philip here, uh, the elder, born in 1554, a rare ornament of his age. I really shouldn't put that in, because that's what his father said. But I just think it's such a lovely quote. A rare ornament of his age. Author of the famous Arcadia, um, now, he died in 1585. Robert, the younger one, born in 1563, his recently discovered poems demonstrate his belief in the Neoplatonic philosophy of love. So here's another clue to an understanding of uh, these, this esoteric symbolism within the, the, the works of this early modern group. Um, He's never a candidate for the authorship of Shakespeare, but certainly he wrote extremely good poetry and uh, uh, certainly this, with this philosophy. After the Earl of Leicester died, Robert Dudley, he became the Baron de Lisle. He was, of course, they were nephews of Robert Dudley, the Earl of Leicester. Um, and after his death, he then took on the baronetcy of de Lisle and became Earl of Leicester. <coughs> he was also the father of Mary Roth, who uh, you may know about. Uh, we'll, we'll come on to her later on. So let's look at Arcadia, <clears throat> the Arcadia that was so much an influence on some of Shakespeare, uh, particularly King Lear and Cymbeline. Um, and I believe this is the work that opened the door to the works of Shakespeare. And it's not, it was never meant to be published. He didn't want it to be published. But it did get published by Mary Sidney after his death. And again, I'll come on to that uh, in a moment. But I want you to look very closely at some of the symbolism. I'd like you to look here at this porcupine. That is the Sidney family crest. 
the porcupine, seen here also uh, in rather beautifully uh, uh, extravagant version. It's the Dudley emblemata, <coughs> and as I say, the Dudley is, the, uh, is Mary Sidney's um, mother's family. Mary Dudley is Mary Sidney's mother, and so there is this extraordinary, wonderful connection with the Dudley family. Uh, this, is, uh, this is now, today, at the uh, Le Lord Leicester Hospital in Warwick. It's a symbol of invincibility. It's a druidic symbol. Uh, and so is this boar. But I'm going to come on to that in a second. I want to show you the other one. Is this Fion or Awen, a druidic symbol? And there it is again. You can see it's just above the porcupine at, uh, whoops, at Leicester. Um, and here at the gardens at Penshurst, which is the Sydney family home, there it is today uh, in the garden. Still today, they honour this um, emblem. And also the porcupine, it's, it's all over the gardens. Um, here at Horton House, which is Mary Sydney's last home, um, there it is over the doorway of her house. This, you can go and see this house. It's, it's in ruins, but it's absolutely fantastic. It's in Bedfordshire and very, very beautiful and very bad picture. But I tried to close in on the Arwen there. You can just see that centre and the V of the Arwen uh, with M for Mary. So she wanted to honour that right up to the end. That was uh, built by um, uh, Inigo Jones. And so honouring that symbolism was very much uh, an important part and I believe is a druidic connection and a bardic connection with the Sydneys. Uh, so um, here's another picture of her. Again, there's the Fion or Arwen over her head. And there are pictures of all the family uh, with this Arwen over their heads. Now, just going back to the boar symbolism, again, a very druidic symbol. Here's the boar that we saw earlier. This is in the frontispiece of Arcadia. Uh, and here it is in, in the Alciat, um, Alciat uh, 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 Andreas Alciat etching. And it's a magnificent symbolic with the AA symbols, if you know about the AA symbols, uh, the M symbol, and this uh, plus ultra, which, which means um, uh, more beyond. And Peter Dawkins talks a lot about this uh, symbolism as the ruins of Solomon's temple. So that's Solomon's temple. The, the symbol of the boar, uh, it is uh, the initiate and the swine herd is the, um, the Hierophant. And he believes it's showing the covered uh, crypt of Solomon's temple. Now, uh, this has nothing to do with Shakespeare at all. It's just that there, this wonderful symbolism of the boar is so prevalent in the Sydney uh, emblematic uh, style. So now let's look at Francis Bacon. I, I'm not going into depth about Francis Bacon because my my remit is really on the group theory, but the group theory can't exist without Francis Bacon, as I believe uh, was a mastermind. He was a hermeticist. He knew the law. He was, of course, in the law. Uh, he knew about the tides. He knew about kingship. And he was a philosopher, a historian, and a poet. And I believe was masterminding the perhaps not the entire venture, but was very much a, uh, a, a feature. And while the writing was going on at the Wilson Circle, his circle of writers were writing Twickenham Park, his uh, good pens, and my feeling is they're writing in parallel. Now, the people involved here are people, as I mentioned earlier, Giordano Bruno, John Dee, the great uh, hermeticists, so I want to say a little bit about both of these people. I know, I'm quite sure you all know a great deal about them, but in the link with what I'm talking about, they were hermeticists, favoured by monarchs, both of them, uh, but both found themselves under duress when the Inquisition took hold. Uh, John Dee to die in penury, his library burnt, and uh, Bruno to die in flames when he went back, uh, forced back really to Italy. <coughs> Now, John Dee was a major influence on the German Rosicrucian movement, a towering figure, says Francis Yates, towering figure in the European 
scene of Rosicrucianism. Uh, he was a mathematical genius who tutored two generations of the Pembroke Dudley Sydney family. It's no wonder the Sydney Circle understood uh, as above, as so below. They were brought up to understand the microcosm and the macrocosm. They were steeped in hermeticism, in the scientific, the mystical, as well as the poetic. Mary even had her own alchemical laboratory at Wilton House. Now, Dee's dream was for a great British empire. And, of course, this was the utopian vision also that Francis Bacon had and wrote about in, his, in the New Atlantis. So they're on a par, they're on a level, and, of course, they were great friends, as were Giordano Bruno and Dr. John Dee. Um, these, I believe his ultimate ambition is for uh, attunement of a higher level of consciousness, a uh, transmutation of spirit through alchemy which is what I believe the plays are trying to prove, the divine philosophy. Now, Bruno himself was the divine uh, hermeticist who propagated the esoteric movement in Europe, a return to the values of ancient Egypt uh, and the religion that stemmed from the hermetic tradition. He wanted to heal the religious divisions through Europe, and he had met Philip Sidney in Italy. Uh, I think it was in Venice that they met. And Philip Sidney adored him and invited him to come to England. And of course, he did come to England. Indeed, he stayed for two years, living in, uh, in safety in the French embassy. Um, and then, of course, unfortunately, he went back to Italy, whereupon he was <coughs> murdered. So in 1583, he comes to England. Now, interestingly, this man on the left, Fulk Greville, Philip Sidney's greatest friend, in fact, they met at school. On the first day of school at Shrewsbury, they met um, and were friends right up until um, Philip's death. Fulk Greville was the man who, um, in Ash Wednesday, I don't know if any of you know Ash Wednesday, which was written by, a piece written by Giordano Bruno, he talks about going to Fulk Greville's house in the city, in London. And it's quite an interesting piece to read. You wonder why he talks. He doesn't ever mention Fulk Greville again, but he mentions him here. So uh, he then was to save Mary Sidney's life. When Philip died in 1585, um, uh, there, there were four deaths, almost immediately one after the other. Mary's only daughter died on the same day that her son was born. Um, her parents died, her father first and then her mother, and then the tragic death of Philip himself a couple of months later. Her grief was truly terrible and she nearly died. She really nearly died of heartbreak. But Fulk Greville um, and another man, Abraham France, came to Wilton House and they helped her recover um, and I think sort of brought her back to life and made her realize there was a life worth living despite her grief. So what Fulk Greville did was to get Philip's unfinished Arcadia and his unfinished Psalms and get Mary Sidney to complete them with his help. And I do believe he helped quite a lot. But there it is, that's, that's Mary Sidney, uh, the Countess of Pembroke's Arcadia, getting into print now, something that Philip didn't want, but they believed it was important to get it published, to get it into print. Um, the other man, Edward Dyer, is a great family friend of the Dudley Sidney uh, group, uh, an actor himself and a writer, and he was such a strong alchemist himself, he followed John Dee to Europe, to uh, Bohemia. Um, and in fact, he was also a spy, as of course I haven't said this, but they were all spies, all working for Walsingham on, his, uh, on Her Majesty's service. But Edward Dyer, interestingly enough, went to Denmark to be a witness at the marriage of then James VI of Scotland and Anne of Denmark. 
And guess where they got married? In, in uh, Elsinore Castle. And he was there at the wedding of um, King James, who then, of course, became King James I. So he's a very interesting man and in part of all this. And in fact, Dr. Moffat, this is Thomas Moffat, the doctor who wrote the wonderful work on silkworms that influenced Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, Dr. Moffat says here of Philip Sidney, led by God, with Dee as a teacher and with Dyer as a companion, he learnt chemistry, that starry science, rival to nature, in meaning alchemy. So there's a great circle at Wilton House of contacts, of connections, all of whom are highly literary and highly educated and highly influential. Here are some writers now who are part of the group, Michael Drayson and Samuel Daniel. They're both playwrights and poets. Uh, Michael Drayson, of course, became poet laureate after Spencer died. And his Virgilian epic poem, Polly Albion, um, is one of the most amazing epics to read. It's wonderful, wonderful to read. Uh, 1612, it was actually printed, but I believe it was in, in manuscript in circulation earlier than that. It has an extraordinary resonance with Cymbeline. He talks about, uh, he, he actually really has taken a lot of it from Geoffrey of Monmouth. And if you're a fan of Geoffrey of Monmouth, as I am, you'll know that he talks about Brutus being the grandson of Aeneas of Troy. He talks about King Lud and the naming of London as Lud's town. <coughs> he talks uh, about um, the history of this sacred isle. It's a sacred isle. He writes as the muse of Britain. He is, in fact, the rivers. He is the mountains. He's almost doing landscape work that we might do nowadays. Um, he also tells of Brutus's wife, Inogen. Now, Inogen is the original spelling of Imogen in Cymbeline. So there are all these extraordinary little links that not many people would have known about, but this intimate group of writers and philosophers would have known. Uh, he defends uh, also the legends of King Arthur. Um, but importantly for me, and in my research here, he defends the, uh, the Druidic bards and the, uh, the, the Britons before Roman, the Roman invasion, and the necessity of accepting the oral traditions um, from earlier periods of British history, well before the Roman period, well before. I mean, he, he really is talking about a thousand uh, BC or more, uh, 1500 BC. I really feel he must have loved the symbolism of the marriage between the uh, the daughter of King James when she she married uh, Frederick of the Palatine and the symbolism of the marriage of the Rhine and the Thames, since he was so uh, into that. He calls Mary Sidney Minerva, goddess of the arts, and according to Hen Henslow's diary, which I show in a minute. Um, he wrote 12 plays in one year, in 1598. Um, so a prolific, a prolific writer. Now Samuel Daniel, a very, very interesting poet himself, he was tutor to Mary's sons, William and Philip, um, and he was a protege of Mary. Mary really taught him how to write, and he spends a lot of his time thanking her in his dedications um, and he, he, uh, he wrote the first four books of the Civil Wars, known to be um, an influence uh, and inf informative on the history plays of Shakespeare. And although they weren't uh, uh, printed until 1595, they were certainly were, in, uh, they informed the Shakespeare plays, and I again believe that they were in circulation in manuscript. Most things were. Most things were uh, in circulation in manuscript, and some people never wanted them to be printed. And I'll come on to why in a minute. Um, significantly, he wrote this closet drama, the history, uh, the tragedy of Cleopatra, written in tandem with Mary Sidney's own work, another closet drama, the tragedy of Antony, and the two were then in conjunction, and they both are plays that emphasise the contrast between duty and pleasure. They are political statements. And this is what I believe the Shakespeare plays are too. 
Uh, here is a wonderful picture that's recently, only really recently come to light as being that of Lady Anne Clifford um, in the tragedy of Cleopatra by Samuel Daniel. Uh, the reason we know it is, is because at the back here, this is the quote, this is an actual direct quote from Samuel Daniel's tragedy of Cleopatra, not the Shakespeare one. And of course, women were not supposed to be on stage, but in the drawing rooms of stately homes and private houses, they were. And uh, very bold it was. Uh, whether this is costume or real, I don't know. But it's a very vivid costume, very vivid look, and rather bold and brave, I think. Um, and this is, this is Lady Anne Clifford, and if you know her diaries, they're incredibly tedious, because she writes all the time about her properties up north, which she's trying to claim back, and it's believed that she did get them back eventually through persuading King James that she deserved to have them back. Um, and it's believed that um, she had quite a lot of power. She became Mary Sidney's daughter-in-law on her marriage to Philip, the youngest son. Uh, and uh, for a while, she actually lived at Wilson House. Indeed, she lived at Ramsbury, where Philip had many years before actually written Arcadia. Uh, and she lived at Baynard's Castle, which we come on to, I think, soon. <laughs> so here we have Mary Sidney herself. She was fluent in languages. She spoke uh, Greek, she had uh, Latin, she had Italian, of course French, Spanish, and Hebrew. And Hebrew is very interesting because when she wrote her own psalms, she translated direct from the Hebrew. Now, I believe she understood about the Hebraic language being a sacred language. Uh, she translated many of the French poets, including the, um, uh, the uh, tragedy of, of uh, Antony, which was by, oh, 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 completely forgotten his name. Uh, she was musically gifted. And she cared deeply about the relationship between mathematics, rhythm, and music. Again, this is to do with the iambic pentameter, with the rhythm of speech. She understood about the musicality of language, and this is what she passed on to the others. Uh, I'll just tell you a little more about her here. She, she worked extremely hard at perfecting her poetry and using the mathematical sequences that was so important in the sound of poetry and drama. Still managing to use idiomatic English. Now, this is very interesting, because this is what Shakespeare does. Expands the vocabulary. If he hasn't got a word, he makes up a word. Uh, unkind. Uh, um, there are many, many examples, which I won't give you now, because I haven't, haven't got them in front of me. But there are loads of examples of words that are just created for Shakespeare, and that's exactly what Mary Sidney herself did. Now, she encourages her fellow writers to enhance their work to the highest degree and the highest standards. Oh, she also spoke Welsh. Um, and I believe it's her understanding of the relationship between tension and release, uh, the physics of sound, that helped bring out her extraordinary talent, uh, particularly her use of the iamb iambic pentameter. Now, she encoded certain secret symbols into her text. For instance, the 55th Psalm has 72 lines. 72 is a sacred number. But they have, it's divided into 12 and 3. So there are only three line endings. And those, uh, for all the 72 lines, there are only three line endings. And they are air, I, and A. And every word has the sound of air, or I, or A, for 72 <coughs> lines which is phenomenal. Uh, 72, of course, is the number of degrees in a, in a, a pentacle, pentacle. I think these pentagrammatical patterns are within the text. I think there's a lot more research to be done into why and wherefore they are there. Uh, they're in the design of the Globe Theatre itself. I think Mary understood the divine science of the Hebraic language, of the alphabets. Her translation of the Psalms connected her readers to the temple builder himself, Solomon. And as we saw in the Alciat uh, emblem, Solomon's symbology looms large in this period. So uh, 72 is also the geometric number for truth, the Greek word truth. Um, so I think there's a certain amount of summoning up of powers by using these 
these codes, and I think that she was very involved with this. It's the it's fifty fifth Psalm that she that she wrote. Yes, her translation of the fifty fifth Psalm. Uh, yes, fifty fifth Psalm, because she continued Philip's uh, Psalms. He only did up to I think forty two, and she did the the next hundred and ten. So her homes. Okay, this is Baynard's Castle, a model of it, because of course it burnt down in the Great Fire of London. Now here is the connection with the kings. Richard III was crowned here, and he was offered the crown here, uh, and on his death in 1485, Baynard's castle passed into the ownership of Henry Tudor, who transformed it into a royal residence. So again, we're talking about royal, a royal residence. Uh, Henry VIII gave it to the Earl of Pembroke, Mary's father-in-law, uh, and then it became the Earls of Pembroke's London residence. Uh, and here is Richard III being offered the crown at Baynard's Castle. Indeed, I really think that's Mark Rylance. Don't you think that is Mark Rylance, if you saw his wonderful performance recently uh, at the Globe? So a con nice connection with Richard III. And here is another house of Mary Sidney's. She leased this Crosby Place. There it is on the left as it is in the city originally, owned by uh, the Marquises of Northampton, who also owned Gorenbury. So while Mary was down here in the city at um, Crosby Place, Francis Bacon is up north in the Canonbury Tower doing his writing. So the London bases are very connected by, by ownership. Uh, and here it is today. There, this is it now. Uh, it's been completely transported to Chelsea, and if you drive along the embankment, you see it as you go past. It's there, worth looking at. It's absolutely magnificent. And you see they've hardly changed it. It's just raised up. This, this is uh, ground level. This is obviously a foundation for it, and this archway has been changed to a simple doorway here. But that is brick by brick they transported it. So they must have considered it an important building. It was in, uh, in um, Bishopsgate. Thanks, Ruth. <laughs> Bishopsgate, yes. Yeah, so it was very much a city, a city dwelling. And the interesting thing is that Thomas More lived in it, uh, who wrote the history of Richard III there. So there are extraordinary con uh, connections. Um, it's mentioned three times in the play of, of Richard III. Shakespeare's play mentions Crosby Place. Um, and Thomas More founded his esoteric school here in Crosby Place, of course, a hundred or so years before Mary Sidney rented it. Um, so I, I do believe that uh, some of the writing, if you believe in, in place being an important, uh, and landscape being an important connection, this is, I believe, where some of these things happened. The other interesting, uh, rather curious place is this cave, which I really seriously believe was the cave intended to be uh, to be the idea behind Cymbeline's, uh, behind Imogen's cave in Cymbeline. She, you know, finds a cave with Arviragus and Guiderius, and it's in Pembroke. And this is actually the cave underneath the Pembroke Castle, which nobody would have known about except the Pembrokes and their immediate circle, because, of course, uh, Pembroke Castle was built over the top. Nobody knew about this cave until it was excavated and discovered much later on. Uh, and just to show you a map, here is this uh, castle of Pembroke, and here is Milford Haven, where, of course, um, um, uh, what's the hero called? Um, Posthumus Leonatus arrives back from France at Milford Haven. So it all happens in the land of the Pembrokes. Um, and I'm doing some more research into the fact that it comes to, it, the, they actually start off in Dover and follow what I believe to be the Melcart line uh, from Dover to uh, Pembrokeshire. But that's another story, that's another talk. Uh, so let's look at some of the people involved. Again, the writers, Thomas Nash and Robert Green. These are the men who were employed by Mary Sidney's uh, writing group, the, uh, the, the theatrical group, Pembroke's Men. They were called the Earl of Pembroke's Men, 
But Mary actually was the organizer, the runner, the financial advisor. She was the one who paid the actors. We know this because of a will from one of the actors uh, talking about the Countess paying, her, paying him. So here are the playwrights, two of them anyway. Uh, there was also Kidd and Marlowe. And Peel, Robert Peel, intermittently joining up with either group. Um, now, they were talented wordsmiths, but Green, he is so shown with this extraordinary um, death uh, veil on. Uh, what do you call it? It's a, it's a death shroud. shroud. Thank you. Very odd painting. But he is actually uh, one of the writers who died quite early. Very unpopular because he was a bit of a troublemaker. Um, not such a good writer, perhaps. Green was not considered to have the same sustainability as Marlowe, for instance. And it seems what Mary did was to send them, this couple, uh, Nash and Green, some of her brother's writings, Astrophil and Stella, his, his poems, as an example of how to sustain interest in iambic pentameter. Um, as well as 20 sonnets of Samuel Daniel. So Nash, <laughs> Nash takes umbrage at this, and he then takes Astrophil and Stella to a bookseller, uh, to um, a printer, gets them printed, and sells them through uh, Thomas Newman. And there it is, this publication. Sir P.S., Sir Philip Sidney, is Astrophil and Stella, wherein the excellence of sweet poetry is concluded at London, printed for Thomas Newman, 1591. Totally illegal, but of course it wasn't illegal because there was no law against publishing other people's works. What he did was he actually augmented this work with some uh, verses by uh, De Vere, the Earl of Oxford, and Thomas Campion. Now Nash accused publicly Mary Sidney of hoarding elitist poetry. That's his very word hoarding the elitist poetry, imprisoned in ladies' caskets. Now, Nash feels justified in taking other people's writings and selling them to a bookseller or printer. It's perfectly legal. And it's why the courtly poets kept their manuscripts under wraps, under tight control. Nash then calls Mary, changes his tune. He calls her eloquent secretary to the muses, a second Minerva, as she's been called by others. The laurel garland, which thy brother so bravely advanced on his lance, is still kept green in the temple of Pallas. There is the spear and the shaker. It seems to me that they are all in on the plot. There's something they all know a bit about what's going on. So now let's just look at Gabriel Harvey, one of the great um, correspondents of Francis Bacon, and, uh, and others. He was a tutor at Cambridge. On this altercation between Mary Sidney and Nash, it's the mightiest miracle of 93. He says, Pleased it hath a gentlewoman rare with phoenix quill in diamond hand of art to muzzle the redoubtable bull bear, Nash, and play the Galliard championess's part. Though miracles surcease, yet wonder see the mightiest miracle of 93. Not such a good poet. But isn't that interesting that there's actually this comment on this disagreement, this altercation between Nash and um, Mary. So let's just look at Henslow's diary. This is the one record we have that the plays um, existed that were put on at the Globe Theatre. It contains records of payments to dramatists, loans to authors, many of those, uh, and to actors, many of those too. Disbursements for costumes and playhouse construction, payments to the Master of the Revels. Um, by this time, we're getting close to Mary Sidney's son being Master of the Revels, ironically. And daily performance receipts for the Rose Playhouse, which Henslow himself built in 1587. William Shakespeare's name is not there. He never once mentions William Shakespeare. Everybody else is mentioned, but the name of William Shakespeare is not there. Now, these are the plays that were anonymous when printed in quarto. That's the small quarterly quarter format um, that was 
uh, often printed um, sometimes illegally or some you know by error sometimes by actors they call them the um, uh, Hamlets and so on the taming of the shrew Titus Andronicus Henry VI part two Henry VI part three Romeo and Juliet Richard II Richard III Henry IV part one none of these had Shakespeare's name on until the folio And I just want to say something about attribution studies. People say to me, but surely nowadays, there's so much research computers can show the attribution studies of words and diction and language that must make a certain author stand out. Well, here's the proof that Edward III, uh, anonymous, was written by, and this is over, I think, uh, a period of uh, perhaps 100 years. Different academics have said it was written by George Peel, Christopher Marlowe with George Peel, Robert Greene and Thomas Kidd, Thomas Kidd alone, Michael Drayton, Robert Wilson, William Shakespeare, William Shakespeare and one unknown other, William Shakespeare and Christopher Marlowe, William Shakespeare and several others excluding Marlowe. So it makes no sense. There is no proof. There is absolutely no uh, proof. And however many academics say that we can prove it was uh, Peel or... Uh, Fletcher writing with Shakespeare, it's almost impossible because everybody disagrees. Now to just shift the uh, subject for a moment to Tintin, the wireworks at Tintin. This is a, a whole new subject that uh, Joy Hancock has been working on. And there's a brass plaque which says near this uh, place in the year 1568, brass was first made by alloying copper with zinc. And so we know that they had a wire works, they had a brass works at Tintin. And I went there recently to research it, and it's absolutely massive. There's masses of stuff about it, but here nobody knows about it. And the importance and the connection is that this wire works was owned by our group, Francis Bacon, um, William Herbert, Mary's son, um, another William Herbert who happens to live in St. Julian's in Monmouthshire, who is a, um, a cousin um, and, a, and a very close friend of John Dee's, and ironically, although I did think I wouldn't bring him into it because it's too complicated, he was part of the Monas Hieroglyphica design. So, and he, ha he wanted to have a mystery school at Tintin, but he died before anything was completed, which is why it's believed that Francis Bacon may have continued uh, a mystery school there. Uh, Joy Han Hancock's tells us uh, it was at Tintin that the brass plates were made following the instructions of Theodore de Brie, the prototype for the geometry of the playhouses. Records survive that show the Tintin wire works did trade in Southwark. Now that's where the Rose, the Globe, the Swan theatres all were. Here's Theodore, Theodore de Brie, um, a Huguenot. Um, <clears throat> and here on the right is one of the the uh, prototype plates for the Globe, I think it's for the Globe, oh no, it's, yes, it's for the Globe Theatre, 1599. And Joy Hancock has done massive amounts of work on this, and I think it's pretty close to proving that the designs of these theatres came from our group and that the wire works in Tintin created these brass or bronze plaques. I also believe that a lot of the watermarks, the wire used in watermarks, comes from this place too, um, because Francis Bacon had his own watermarks, Michael Drayton had his own watermarks, a lot of them had their own um, symbology, usually grapes, usually a pot, but it was, um, they are all Rosicrucian uh, symbolisms, symbol, uh, symbols. So let's just go back to Pembroke's men themselves. Mary's company, Pembroke's men, played at the Globe and the Swan and the Rose Theatres, in the early 90s, they were the first troupe to play uh, The True Tragedy and The Contention, which became, in the folio, the, uh, the second and third parts of Henry VI, but until then, they were known as The True Tragedy uh, and The Contention, all dealing with her ancestral family. Uh, one of the first companies to perform Titus Andronicus and Marlowe's Edward II. Of course, we believe Marlowe was one of the co-writers of the... Uh, of the uh, of Pembroke's men, because most companies did hire writers to to use. 
Um, so it is my belief that uh, the, these, these, uh, the theater was a conduit for the hermetic writings. They used the theater, they used the plays to pass the hermetic knowledge through. And that's why they lasted so long, that's why they're still so great today, because there's an undercurrent of hermetic truths in them. Uh, the, the, it was a conduit for the hermetic writing of the age to raise the spirit to a higher awareness. Um, so let's look at Philip and William. This is Philip now grown up, um, became the third Earl of uh, Pembroke when his father died, and his younger brother, Philip, a nasty piece of work. <laughs> I think he was a most unpleasant young man. Never ever has he um, appealed to me. He's the one who married Lady Anne Clifford and gave her a hard time. I think they, they lived separately from the moment they got married. But it's rather interesting that um, in this picture of Sir William Herbert, this is the third Earl, this wonderful spear, a wonderful uh, sword of state, because he's now Lord Chamberlain, um, is incredibly symbolic. And I've been talking to Anthony Thorley, as I said earlier, about his work, where he believes that Wilton House, and this is Wilton House here, Wilton House is the very foot of a landscape spear that comes right down through the St. George's, Osborne St. George, through Stonehenge, comes right down to Wilton. And of course, Wilton was the cap a royal capital of, of, of uh, Wiltshire. It's connected with the royals in many ways because King James stayed there, K uh, Queen Elizabeth went there. Later on, King Charles went there. And uh, of course, during the war, this last war, Eisenhower and Churchill um, devised the Normandy landings from, uh, from the, the cube rooms at, at Wilton House. So I think there's an enormous amount of uh, connection with power at Wilton. But that's, again, I keep going off into other subjects, really. But they are the noble pair. Here we have the 1623 folio dedication to the most noble and incomparable pair of brethren, William, Earl of Pembroke, Lord Chamberlain to the King, and Philip, Earl of Montgomery, and gentlemen of the, uh, of, of the bedchamber. We won't go into that. But they were both knights of the noble order of the Garter, um, and of course, William was the Grand Master of uh, the, the Freemasons. It is indeed, yes. I think you told me that. So William was Lord Chamberlain since 1615. The folio was started uh, printing in, six, well, put together in 1621. But at Mary Sidney's death that September six, uh, 1621, everything stopped. It was resumed in 1622, and then the actual publication was in 1623. Hemming and Conville, the actors, collated the works. Ben Johnson edited. Now, I haven't really talked about Ben Johnson, but I do believe he was deeply involved. Uh, of course, William uh, the, uh, the Third Earl was a patron of Johnson and he indeed paid him £20 a year for books. And I believe he had a room at Wilton House. So I haven't I found proof of that. Now, uh, 150 years later, 1758, we have the Huguenot connection again. This is Rubiac, who the great um, uh, sculptor who created this Shakespeare statue for Garrick. Garrick himself a Huguenot, David Garrick. His father was one of the Huguenots to come over um, uh, with the, in, the, in the early 18th century. And Rubiac is the most amazing, real uh, sculptor of, of, of very, very beautiful, uh, realistic characters. And this is one he did also of Francis Bacon for Wilton House. Now, I can't get to the bottom of why they want Francis Bacon at Wilton House. And uh, nobody can answer that, but it's there. And it's beautiful. You're not allowed to photograph it. But as you see, oops, I did. Um, <laughs> here is uh, Westminster Abbey uh, Shakespeare, the Shakespeare statue. This, these ones are designed, designed by... Um, have I got it here? No, I haven't but made by Schemakers, 
Kent, William Kent, the great landscape um, uh, architect, actually, designed this statue of Shakespeare, and it was created by Schemakers. And this one points to words from uh, the Tempest, uh, but it's garbled. It's very garbled, and nobody quite knows why it should be uh, leave not a wreck behind. Um, and lots of odd misspellings. But he points to the word, oops, oh, I'll get it right in a minute. He points to the word temples. You can't see it, it's a dreadful picture, but he points to the word temples. Now, the very same statue is at Wilton House. Um, and here, it's on a round plinth. You see this is circular. Uh, the previous one is square. Strange angle, but it's square. This is round, so I believe it's kind of squaring the circle. Um, he is pointing to the word shadow. It's from Macbeth. Life is but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. As if to say, Shakespeare is but the shadow of the real writers at Wilton House. And that's the end. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> exactly on the hour. I don't know if anybody has any questions, if there's time for any questions. Or too much to assimilate. Chris. Um, did you, have you come across any involvement with uh, James I understand he took over the kind of sponsorship of the arts. Well, he was, of course, a great patron. Huge patron of the arts. Yes, he was. I think it's, uh, yes, his, his, his talent um, as a patron of the arts is a bit underestimated. He was hugely important. And of course, the King James Bible was his idea in English. Um, and of course, he went to Wilton House, stayed there, in fact, ran the country from there for a bit when the plague was um, in, Lon in London. Um, I think the plague had an effect on in, mon in many ways that they'd have to go, they'd have to leave the, they leave, uh, the town and go to the country. Um, yes, I think there's a lot more to do on the research of King James's collection. He was very much, uh, very much in love with, William, with um, Philip, the younger son of Mary. And there's a rather ghastly story of finding on, William, on Philip's wedding morning, uh, he wakes up to find the king in bed with him and his wife. <laughs> Weird, 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 weird. So he has some strange goings on there. But yes, a lot, a lot to consider of his connection. <laughs> I agree. Does it make sense to you? Does it make sense? Tony, sorry. He does. He was a brother-in-law, Mary's brother-in-law, because his wife was uh, one of the Dudley daughters. Is that right? Robert, Robert Dudley's sister married John Florio, so there's a family connection. And, of course, he was a translator from the Italian. Mm. And he taught. That, I mean, I think... I think he taught... He, that's right. He was the teacher, their teacher of Italian. And he did. He came to Wilton House to be the sort of uh, uh, linguist, conversation to have conversations with uh, with the boys. And there was a daughter. I never mentioned the daughter because she doesn't figure very largely in this. Unfortunately, nobody really knows what happened to her. Do you, do you have a book coming out soon? <laughs> no, I should. I know. I know. I, I, I dedicated last year to publishing it. And now we're into 2013, and I still haven't. Find me a publisher, Chris. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I think I even put on the advert to really prove that I'm going to do it as part as a chapter of her book. When I spoke at the Globe last year on esotericism and hermeticism in Shakespeare, I said, 
as part of her a forthcoming book, Shaking the Spear. Susan's giving you a, a chapter. But Did he? I do you know I didn't know he lived in Hackney. Oh, wow. I thought he lived in more city, more Fleet Street. Sure that's that's, that's Hackney interesting. Hackney. I like that. Yeah. yeah. And of course, he became Lord Brooke and Earl of Warwick, which is another curious connection because Mary's uncle was Earl of Warwick. It's really weird. I mean, I think the family, inter family connections are very different then from now. Um, and, you know, th they really had these interconnecting families in a vast way because they were, it was kind of new, it was kind of nouveau riche in a way. You know, from Henry VIII's time, it was different. And then the money came pouring in. Pembrokes, the Earls of Pembroke owned not only most of Salisbury, they owned the whole of Salisbury Plain, Stonehenge, they owned right up to Marlborough, they owned all that sacred landscape where you now see crop circles in the summer. So there's a kind of oddness about that too, that they own this very sacred land. He did, yes. And so the, yes. the royal line then uh, would want yes. to make sure that the family ties and all yes. the sacred family and its uh, earls and um, family. Yes. So, so I think there's quite a lot of building up of the Tudor dynasty within the Shakespeare plays. Right. Um, and I think that's uh, quite an important factor. Ironically, when Francis Bacon writes, you know the only play that isn't, that there isn't, uh, is Henry VII. There's no play of Henry VII. But Francis Bacon wrote the history of Henry VII. Um, and it's very odd reading. It's very odd because I had to read it three times for my dissertation because he, it's, he really sets him up and then knocks him down, rather like the writing of the characters in Henry V, where Henry V is built up to great heroic dimensions and then undercut by some nasty... Uh, thing happening straight after uh, and in fact he's another nasty piece of work but and I think that there's, there's a sort it's like sabotage but I don't think it's sabotage I think it's this sort of initiatory way of writing that is kind of leading you on and then pulling you back um, and I just think that uh, I, I can't say how much of this is Francis Bacon's work I can't say how much is Mary's work, except I do feel that the Mary did boost the women's parts. And in fact, what I haven't included in this talk, um, it's in an another one, is where the dialogue changes phenomenally and the, the French is improved, the women's uh, speeches are en enlarged and given more body uh, in all the history plays that were performed by the Pembroke's men, by her acting troupe. So that by the time you get to the folio, there they are in all their glory that we know nowadays, but they weren't in the original format. So it's possible that we'll never know the truth. I, it's rather sad, but I suspect that we may never know the truth unless, you know, somebody uh, comes from outer space and says, well, I can tell you, I can tell you what happened. But I just don't think we'll ever really know. And those, th that's why I point out that these works, the, the, um, the computer works, they, they spend thousands and thousands on, don't prove anything. Don't prove anything. Apart from anything, they're not comparing with the right people. They're not comparing with Mary Sidney and Francis Bacon. They're comparing with other authors like Beaumont and Fletcher. So it's, uh, it's never going to prove anything. Those studies, what are they called? I have the name up. Um, uh, um, attribution studies. Very big. Well, if, you do an, if you do a master's degree in the Shakespeare authorship, that's what you're supposed to study. It's interesting you sort of mention um, Crosby and Bores mm. um, and uh, when you mentioned so near they are about this mm. on the strand because this was a landing place for the Jesuits. Ah. Oh, right. Oh, right. And, uh, and 
of course, Baynard Castle was right on the river right, fleet. The drawing, you the, the yeah. The yes, that's so right. Do you know, ironically, right next door to Baynard Castle is Island Place or Island Passage where William Shakespeare, the actor, is supposed to have rented a room. And it seems to me perfectly straightforward to believe that he was the broker and that, th and that plays were perhaps passed through him. And of course, eventually his name took over because many of those anonymous plays that I showed you earlier had um, Shakespeare's name put onto them later on. Um, and, and of course, many plays, as you probably know, that weren't anything to do with William Shakespeare, but they thought they were onto a good thing, and they added Willi by William Shakespeare to you know things like um, Doctor Pollypot's piss pot and <laughs> <laughs> things like that. <laughs> Sorry, this is. Sorry, uh, Oh, sure. Well, this is the great thing, that for the whole group, easy access to the globe, to the rose, to the swan, absolutely straightforward, perfectly normal to be seen going over. And the work being done at Tintern is interesting, because by, by um, not far from the wire works, um, there is an amazing church called St. Michael's Church, and their finding there was a slipway, where it would have been very straightforward to come up the seven, um, and not be seen. I mean, it would be, you know, kind of secretive because it's a very secretive place. And uh, they're now actually excavating it and finding the waterways, uh, um, what's it called, a, a little dock, little mini port. You were trying to... Uh, it was at Crosby Place, the Thomas More one, do you mean? Yes, it was at Crosby Place. No, no, it didn't seem to have a name. No, no, it didn't. Um, and I would love to know more about it, and that I need to research more. I don't really know that much about Thomas More. Um, I should re really read up on him, because I do think Mary was following something really interesting in taking that place, renting that building, uh, when she had such a connection herself with Richard III and with Baynard Castle. But by then she'd been, she was the dowager countess and was well kicked out of the family. She was having to lead her own life. And of course much disapproved of because I don't know if you know, but she, she, um, she uh, got together with a very nice young doctor called Robert Lister. And they went to the continent a lot to spa and when they went to the continent, they'd spend a long time there. Most, most uh, sort of summer, uh, winters they'd spend there, where she famously dressed up in male attire, uh, as was quite the sort of thing to do on the continent, and smoke a pipe. So she was doing all this kind of manly stuff. I think by now she wasn't writing. My gut feeling is, because I don't know if you know about um, um, Francis Bacon's great friend, um, yes, names escape me. Anyway, I think that he was contacting Francis Bacon and she was a friend, they were both friends of Francis Bacon and she was, I think, passing writings to him to take to England when she was abroad. And the reason I think that is because there are letters extant which, say, which talk about her passing works. So it could be that she was actually still writing and passing information. Or it could be just that it was part of the spying network. That I'm, I'm not sure, you might know more. But uh, yes, I'd love to know if it sort of makes sense and if it resonates with this goodly audience. It does? Good. You have some feelings about uh, Wilton Chris, I think, don't you? Um, 
as a sacred place. Yeah, that's yes. Yes. Well, I think this is what this is what Anthony Thorley is working on, yeah. and uh, and the interesting thing about this sword coming down, pointing, ending at Wilton, is that the line of churches along this sword are all uh, St George's or St Michael's. So they're all to do with spearing the dragon, spearing the dragon energy. I think there's one St Margaret's, but St Margaret is the female version anyway. Uh, St Margaret is Margaret Bancock spearing mm. the dragon. Yes, exactly. So it's the same. It's all the same. Isn't that extraordinary? So I think there's a lot more work to do in looking at the landscape and why Wilton focusing, why, why, why uh, Wilton is so um, prevalent and relevant to the whole story um, in, all, in the whole Shakespeare authorship. Uh, it's just not worth the talk. It is, yes, just, yes, yeah. Uh, and of course, uh, as you, uh, you know, again, Mary Sidney was known as the Swan of Avon. She, she was, her symbology was the swan because in French, uh, Sydney, they couldn't say Sydney, they said Sydney. So Philip Sydney was always called Le Cine, and she was known as the Swan of Avon because the River Avon runs through Salisbury and their lands came right down to the River Avon. So the whole thing about Shakespeare being the Swan of Avon uh, was a jolly youthful connection with Stratford and, uh, and the truth being a little further south. I find it very interesting too that people are always thinking about the sword going in. I see the sword coming out. Oh, that's nice too. Yes. And the, the swan is very much the song of undying love. And the most beautiful sound on planet Earth is the, the sound of the swan as it passes. Oh, yes. And oh, yes. I think that, the, that there's an awful lot of fear around the dragon energy because the dragon energy is the fire. You see it as replicating. I love that. I love that. Yes. I love that. I tell you why I love that, Rosemary, because uh, in my conversation with Anthony today, I said, well, what about Ramsbury? Ramsbury is where they wrote Arcadia. Um, and the manor house, in part, still exists. It's owned by some wealthy Russian. Um, but it's, it's not part of the line it's a kind of extension of the line, as it were, like an arc shape. There's Ramsbury, there's the line at, oh, I've, forgotten the name of, um, I've forgotten the name of the actual place, and then Marlborough and Merlin's Mound. So it's as if there's a lovely, as you say, like a fanning out of the light, maybe. And right that at the beginning, when you said about the... Northeast the, the, the of... Ball. Yes. Like to me, yes. Which is like the uh, tree of life, the Kabbalah of the three pillars. And the porcupine, it didn't look like a porcupine to me, this one here. It looked like a bear with spines on yes, it. Yes, it's actually, it's and funny you should say that because I often think it looks it like a bear. It doesn't look like a porcupine to me at all because a porcupine's face is very different. And I thought, why has that bear got all those spears? <laughs> <laughs> It is very odd, I agree, and it often does look like a bear. It doesn't look like a... Um, and also, the chap there that just went by, I don't think he was a human being. Oh, which chap's that? <laughs> yes, you can now. You, c you can go down, you have to go down a, a whole series of steps. Yes, it does. No, That's right. Yeah, yes. Was no. So it's it's back to the well, See, they were, they were there. Those were the balls. Of course, the, 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 the bear, the bear is the Dudley symbol. The bear and the ragged staff oh, well, is, the, is the Dudley, the other Dudley symbol. So they've got the bear, the bear and the Sydneys have the porcupine. Bear's bristles is very, very strong, like a spine. 
It is funny, isn't it? I don't know how old that one is um, in Warwick. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. It does look like a bear. I shouldn't think they are original. I no, I didn't. What is it on? Is it on a coronet? I don't know. It's a coronet. Oh, it is a coronet. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Portugal. Going back to see anything I've missed. But, uh, the, uh, the swine, uh, there's an interesting line on this swine. Uh, the swine herd has to do seven years. St. Patrick uh, was a swine herd. Um, muckish. Muckish means mm -hmm. the, the swine herd. It's, it's a strange. So, uh, as it, so, in a sense, the hierophant. It, that's He's the hierophant. Is, yeah. And he was uh, yeah. initiated uh, in that way and after his, re his retreat from. You see, what I do think is interesting is this connection with Druidism. Uh, the family is steeped in it. I think they, I think there's a, I think they might be bards. They might have been a bardic family of old. I, it's very difficult to go back and find out because, of course, nothing is written. Um, but I do, th and my gut feeling is that there's, there's a bardic tradition within the Sydney family. As much as probably, it, it's probably a stain that's been laid on our faith. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he came back after the exile from Brittany, from mm. Carmack, mm, mm, mm. and became Earl of uh, Pembroke. Well, and of course, on the, on the um, William the Conqueror. Uh, but the, the first place outside of England where William the Conqueror attended to his inauguration. Of <coughs> but the irony is that he landed at Milford Haven mm -hmm. in exactly the same way as posthumous. Leonatus landed. And the other lovely connection with Cymbeline is that Brutus, when he came to England with his wife Inogen, um, his father had died before he was born, so he was known as Posthumus. Isn't that fascinating? As in Cymbeline. It's extraordinary what Shakespeare has managed to fit into this play. It is extraordinary. It's really extraordinary. I know, Rosemary, exactly. I know. Well, that's exactly what I mean. I yes. have to put my hand up here. Yeah. I didn't study Shakespeare particularly, so I'm not really that okay with his work. But you certainly opened the Pandora's box for me. <laughs> well, I don't think you do have to know the works, but just to know how they're still played, how the Globe Theatre is the most successful tourist uh, um, site we have, apart from Stratford-upon-Avon, which is the most successful site and you know it's a billionaire it's a billionaire business and, and they will never let go of that yeah. that's the problem is that they won't let, ever let go of the Stratford empire because it's worth billions and Stanley Wells is holding on very fast to it he's producing a book coming out shortly it might be this month which is trying to knock on the head every ounce of uh, disbelief in the man from Stratford so it'll be very interesting to see how he does it because they can't prove, they cannot, I mean, that is their problem. They can't prove anything about Stratford, uh, William of Stratford. They really can't. Even things like ha the name of their son, Hamnet, you know, all of them, he must have written Hamlet. There was, uh, the butcher's son was called Hamlet. They had twins and they called them Hamlet, Hamlet and Judith and he just took the same name. It's extraordinary. It's extraordinary how they've been twisting <coughs> to suit themselves the history of William Shakespeare. I'd love to go back in time. Can anybody here do that? <laughs> I'm sure a few of us can. It's, it's, the, it's the result of a good military school to, to present um, a believable centre of the myth. Mm. That's their work. Mm. And if you create this mm. person, William Shakespeare, this family, and, mm. and the various houses all scattered around Stratford, it would be a blind to yeah. the that's right, yeah. It would be, it would be the absolute contrivance yeah. and the Elizabethan bizarre contrivance. Uh, indeed, uh, indeed. And, and uh, you know, it is, again, David Garrick's doing that Stratford is so uh, massive because he created the first festival there. 
Shakespeare had lost the plot. I mean, he was not very popular. The, the, as, uh, the, the plays were not very popular. And in the Restoration, I mean, of course they weren't popular because there was no theatre during the Commonwealth. When the Restoration happened, um, pop, uh, theatre was very popular. The playwrights just took Shakespeare and twisted it and ch changed the endings. Romeo and Juliet uh, was completely changed to a happy ending. You know, extraordinary. They did extraordinary things with Shakespeare. It was treated very badly, and he was kind of thought of as a rather low-lying, low uh, un unimportant playwright. It was Garrick who, as I believe, um, Huguenot, a Freemason, he, was, uh, he had uh, a lodge named after him, so I think he must have been a Freemason, um, and his group, Pope, Lord Burlington, all in that sort of R Rosicrucian Freemason, Freemasonic group, they then built up the name of Shakespeare. They went to Stratford. They had a festival where the festival theatre is now. They held a rather disastrous festival because it poured with rain. But that's where they held it. They began the tree, the history of the tree, the house, everything about Shakespeare began then in the 18th century, the mid 18th century. Uh, and of course, Garrick himself adored Shakespeare, played every male lead there was in Shakespeare, had that statue that I showed you by Rubiac built in his temple at Hampton Court, where he had a house at Hampton. And in this temple, uh, which again I researched uh, quite, quite thoroughly, um, this beautiful statue of Shakespeare was a focal point, and it was almost um, Freemasonic. Seven steps up to the temple, the doors through two twin pillars, Shakespeare at the end. He was setting him up as a, as a god, really. And that's where the godlike status of, of uh, Shakespeare began. So we blame Garrick. But I guess he must have thought he was doing the right thing. And indeed, in a, to a certain extent, he was, you know, bringing back the, the real Shakespeare you using the folio. You know, yes. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely, you're absolutely right. I, I think you might be right, Polly. I, I suspect a lot more people knew than have ever let on. Um, it's, if you've ever tried to get in touch with any of the families now, the Pembrokes, the Sydneys, they all still exist and live in their houses. They will have nothing to do with it. It's really intriguing. But my book will change all that. <laughs> so... Well, because I think they were, you know, part of the strong Protestant movement, um, to, uh, and they were mostly very, very glad to be in England, very supportive of English writing, and I think that they were party to the whole movement of building up Shakespeare. Um, in fact, uh, Theodore de Brie also was a Huguenot, uh, in, uh, the earlier, one of the earlier ones, who did the brass plaques for the Globe Theatres. Might well have been. A lot of them came from Antwerp, um, Belgium. So yes, possibly. I could be up a gum tree. I mean, I really could. It could be a red herring. It's, it's, you know how you go with gut feelings and you find, oh, no, and he's a, he's a Huguenot too. So you kind of jigsaw them together and I could be getting the wrong, the wrong edge to the wrong edge. I'm not, I don't know yet. Yeah, oh, very much so. Oh, I forgot to say that the whole group is part of the Protestant ethos um, post-Mary. So it would, it would fit nicely in, yeah. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> no, I just think it's, it's intriguing. Uh, well, this is this is. I, I do believe Francis Bacon was was masterminding. It. But I see, this is where I, uh, stylistically, they're all so different. They're all so different within each play. There's a huge difference. The, the only the sort of thing that the continuity that goes through is that they're all stunning plays with wonderful. Uh, uh, um, moral stories about do not uh, ruin your country by falling in love with the wrong person. Do not let your passion overrule your kingliness. 
or your, 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 your head. Do not let your, if for instance, Antony and Cleopatra, um, they lose not only the country, she loses her dynasty. The whole of uh, the Ptolemy dynasty is wiped out by her having an affair with Antony because her son dies, and that's the end of her din the dynasty. So it's big stuff. They're talking about big stuff, dynamic, uh, big dynamics. Yes, yes, which is why we do it. <laughs> sure, we've gone way over time. I'm ever so sorry. <laughs> You're coming back, aren't you? <laughs> but for part two. You've all got to come and see Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy in the autumn. Well, I'll send, I'll, I'll get Chris to put out a, um